everyone and very welcome to St Alfie Sea Salter in this August time. Yes, it's still a uh, very strange times. The new normal that we're all in is a bit difficult to get used to. But here we are and we're going to worship together this morning. Wherever you are, you're very welcome. And we'd like you just to join with us as we worship God together in St Alfie. Now it is a holiday time isn't it and a lot of people will be going to a few places generally in this country of course uh, but it is a time that we would see other people coming into our church visitors from all over the place and if you're a visitor this morning we do extend a very warm welcome to you. We've been meeting like this for some time and it is proving to be a bit of a trial for some people but some of us are being quite inventive. I know that it, it does appear to be a bit of a roller coaster. If you've been on holiday, you may have been on one. It's that sense of highs and then lows. And then if you're in a maze, you're all over the place, aren't you? You don't know which way to turn. You don't know how you're going to get out of it. So let's just still ourselves for this hour this morning. Worship together, join together and just be ourselves before the Lord. If you've got a chance this week, you might just have a look at 1 Peter 1 because it really spoke to me this week. I won't read it now, but do have a look at that because it could almost be speaking about these times. So let's just take a deep breath and we're going to light the candle and we're going to say our opening sentences. Do join with me as we do that now. The candle is lit. As we wait in silence, fill us with your spirit. As we listen to your word, fill us with your spirit. As we worship you in majesty, fill us with your spirit. As we long for your refreshing, fill us with your spirit. As we long for your renewing, Fill us with your spirit, as we long for your equipping, fill us with your spirit. As we long for your empowering, fill us with your spirit. Amen. Morning Church, songs today talk about us kind of holding on to God in these difficult times. We're going to sing, there's strength within the sorrow, and then Turn your eyes upon Jesus. There is strength within the sorrow. There is beauty in our tears. And you meet us in the morning. With a love that casts out fear You are working in our waiting Sanctifying us When beyond our understanding You're teaching us to trust Your plans are still to prosper If not forgotten us you're with us in the fire and the flood Faithful forever, perfect in love You are sovereign over us You are wisdom unimagined Who could understand your ways Reigning high above the heavens down in endless grace You're the lifter of the lonely Compassionate and kind You surround and you uphold me And your promises are my delight Your plans are still to prosper Not forgotten us You're with us in the fire and the flood Faithful forever, perfect in love, you are sovereign over us. Even when the enemy means for evil, turn it for our good. You turn 
turn it for our good, for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You're working for our good. You're working for our good, for your glory. Even when the enemy means for evil, you turn it for our good. You turn it for our good, for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You're working for our good. You're working for our good, for your glory. Your plans are still to prosper. You've not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. You're faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign in us. Faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign in Turn your eyes upon Jesus. really hard time my prayer would be that we can all kind of hold on to that and keep our eyes on Jesus even though we're missing each other help us to really hold on dear Lord please help us to hold on to you amen I invite all of you to take a few moments to think about all the things which you want to say sorry to God for all the things which you do say and think which may harm yourselves and others. You raise the dead to life in the spirit. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. You bring pardon and peace to the broken in heart. Christ, have mercy. Christ, Christ have, have mercy. You make one by your spirit the torn and divided. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have, have mercy. mercy. May God forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. Amen. I'm reading Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 to 28. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is demon-possessed and suffering terribly. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. 
Yes, it is, Lord, she said. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus said to her, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed at that moment. This reading is from Romans chapter 11, uh, verses 1 and 2, and then uh, from verse uh, 29. I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I'm an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. And then verse 29. For God's gifts and his call are irrevocable. Just as you who were at one time disobedient to God have now received mercy as a result of their disobedience, so they too have now become disobedient in order that they too may receive mercy as a result of God's mercy to you. For God has bound everyone over to disobedience so that he may have mercy on them all. Good morning, church. We have, or we should have by now, a heightened awareness of situations where racial prejudice is at play. Hopefully, we all understand that all humans should be considered to be equal regardless of their race or their skin colour. If you're a Christian, this is more than a logical or a moral imperative, because it stems from the knowledge that each one of us, wherever we come from, is God-ordained, spirit-breathed and loved as a unique creation. Each one of us is a child with a place in the kingdom of God. You'll also know then that we need to be active partners with Christ in the kingdom work of making that belief a reality in our societies, in our structures and of course in our churches, which really should be a little piece of heaven reflecting the true love of God in and for one another. We need to see our differences and our skin colour but rejoice in both our diversity and our family bond as brothers and sisters in Christ. This is the will of God for humanity, so it should be our will too. There is so much work still to be done in our world, isn't there? Because people still do hate or hold prejudice on the basis of race or skin colour, and some quite consciously. But the fact is, most of us hold unconscious bias and beliefs and stereotypes about others that we have learned or absorbed during our upbringing and as we make our way in the world. Try a simple thought experiment. If I say, what are Italians like? Or what are Mexicans like? Or what are the Chinese like? See how quickly your brain jumps to generalities, to media portrayals, or to stereotypes. Mine does too. From there, it's easy to become dismissive and suspicious of otherness, forgetting that we are different too. Hopefully we're in a season of waking up to our prejudices and our biases and our downright overt racism in some cases. It requires laying down our egocentric assumption that things revolve around us and recognising the global nature of God's love and God's promises. I wonder if you remember as a child going to someone else's house for tea and eating different things to the things you had at home or perhaps noticing that their house had strange smells or their rules were different and their parents didn't behave quite the same way as yours. You'd come away with the impression that they had an odd way of going about things and then as you got older the penny would drop. Their household wasn't wrong or less than yours because it wasn't like yours. It was just different. In the Gospel reading for today, Jesus encounters a Canaanite woman who's keen to get his attention because her daughter is ill and she knows he can heal her. At first sight, his non-response to her shouts for help and then his apparent dismissive reply to her when pressed by the disciples to do something could be read as racially discriminatory, that he won't help her because of where she comes from. That rings all kinds of alarm bells for the woke, doesn't it? However, we need to remember that this is something slightly different. 
The context of Jesus' mission was to bring a message to the Jews. It was to tell Israel that the kingdom they were waiting for had arrived, that the Messiah had come. His miracles and healings were signs of that kingdom. They pointed to that promise. He did not come to heal every sick person. He did, however, show the grace and the love of God through those occasions where his ministry and healing pointed to the ultimate opening out of salvation to all humankind. The people of Israel were the designated promise bearers. Jesus didn't come to undo that, but to bring it to fulfilment. The rest would unfold later, as the early church, led by and in response to the activity of the Spirit of God, took that blessing outwards to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews. So this interaction about the Can- with the Canaanite woman is not about race. It's actually about the focus of ministry. Nevertheless, it seems that Jesus can't resist engaging with someone who shows tenacity and faith. His choice to engage in this way with the outsider, the non-Jew, on several occasions in the Gospels is unusual, I suppose, given Jesus' message to Israel, but not, it seems, unusual for Jesus. If you think of the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, or think of the centurion who sends some Jewish elders to ask for Jesus' help, he's confident that Jesus only needs to say the word and his servant will be healed. Jesus commends that Roman centurion for his faith. We can see from this short interchange with the Canaanite woman and Jesus that she appears to have some kind of insight about him. She calls him son of David. It's a messianic title and it's a remarkable thing really that she uses it. Even the disciples are only just beginning to grasp that truth about their rabbi. When she proves to be tenacious, responding to his reply, I'm here for the lost people of Israel, not for you. Instead of going away, she presses in closer. She kneels at his feet. Jesus then invites her banter. He says, I can't take the food for children and give it to dogs instead. And she doesn't disappoint. She spars back in reply, but with humility and with clever humour. But the dogs always get the crumbs, don't they? Her reply is strangely prophetic, first to the Jews and then to the Gentiles. There's kind of hints in this story of what will come through this Messiah. By faith and by the mercy of Jesus, she brings into the present something that is promised for the future and Jesus commends her for it. Woman, he says, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter is healed. The short verses from Romans that are our first reading for today remind us of this plan, that the salvation plan begins with the Jews. They're captive to a law that they can't keep. Their release through Christ will enable release for all. Mercy is in operation where someone who has power over someone else to punish or to harm them chooses instead to be kind. Mercy is a close ally of grace, which means the free and the unmerited favour of God. God in his grace is merciful. We see what that mercy looks like, don't we, in the story of the prodigal son who returns home in shame, only to be met by his father who is sprinting to welcome him back and to honour his safe return. We see it too with the woman brought before Jesus by that self-righteous mob that wants to stone her for adultery. We see it with the thief on the cross next to Jesus who recognises his own sin and asks Jesus to remember him. Jesus gives him salvation. Mercy has little to do with our own merit and everything to do with God's nature. Sin must be judged or there is no justice. However, God's mercy is expansive. It's often stressed over and over again in the Old Testament that God is merciful and gracious, long-suffering, slow to anger and full of compassion. 
because mercy is in God's nature, our, as we are transformed through the work and the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, we too will find that we can and we should reflect God's mercy in the way that we deal with others. Micah chapter 6 verse 8. What does the Lord require of you but to do justly, love mercy and to walk humbly with your God? The other ally of mercy is forgiveness. Because God has shown us mercy, we can be merciful and that often means being prepared to forgive those who have debts against us of one form or another. Once again, it's worth saying that operating in mercy and forgiveness doesn't mean that the grievance or the sin, the wrong that was done in the first place, doesn't matter, or that the consequences of those things don't need working through. On the contrary, mercy recognises the wrong done, but releases the wrongdoer from a destructive penalty in favour of grace that allows for life and for change and release for all. It mirrors what happens through the death and the resurrection of Jesus, that weight of sin and evil in the world that was so great that to be held accountable for it would have destroyed us. Instead, Jesus takes it upon himself so that we might go free. But that knowledge has to change us, doesn't it? And I guess it changes some more than others. Jesus seemed to think so. Luke chapter 7 and the so-called sinful woman who anoints Jesus' feet with perfume, he picks up on the disapproval of the host at the dinner table who is watching this and takes the opportunity to teach him about mercy and forgiveness, telling him the story of a master um, and some debts. And he says, therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. So when the penny drops for us that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and that that includes us, then we recognise our need for salvation. We recognise that we, too, have been forgiven much. It's interesting that the only line with a condition in it in the Lord's Prayer is forgive us our sins as, as we forgive those who sin against us. Acting with mercy and forgiveness is part of the deal when you are a follower of Jesus. But it's safe to be merciful, even though it may feel costly at the time and maybe even for a lifetime. It's safe because ultimately justice is safely held, not by us, but by God. Nothing escapes the notice of God who is righteous and holy. And one day when Christ returns to renew heaven and earth, there will be judgment of the world. But fortunately, our salvation is safely held too by Christ, who has already paid the penalty that was due. Thanks be to God for that. I'm going to end this talk today with two questions. <clears throat> and the first is this. Do I understand something of God's mercy to me? Do I understand something of God's mercy to me? And the second question is this. Where in my own life do I need God's help to show mercy? Let us declare our faith in God. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world. 
I believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Good morning church. It's lovely to be with you all. I hope you're all keeping well and staying safe. For our prayers today, I have changed the responses. So the responses today are Holy Spirit and the response reply is help us. Loving God, we ask for the gift of your Holy Spirit to help us as we come to our time of prayer. Holy Spirit, help us. We ask for the energy and vision of your spirit as we prepare to enter the next phase of coming out of lockdown. In particular, we pray for children, parents and teachers as they prepare for schools to reopen this week. Let your spirit lift and uphold them with any anxieties or problems that arise in these new beginnings. Holy Spirit, help us. We ask for the power of the Spirit to lead all of us, united across the globe, to care for and to nurture our earth, not to continue ravaging it of its wondrous bounty. We have seen in these past weeks, whilst in lockdown, the earth repairing and regenerating itself. Let this be the start of a continued caring for our amazing earth and for it to continue long after this epidemic. Holy Spirit, help us. We ask for the love and comfort of your spirit for those reaching out to comfort the distressed and we give thanks to the many thousands of helpers, volunteers and all key and essential key workers for carrying on with their jobs to support all across the country knowing that they themselves are at risk with their continued support and efforts. Holy Spirit, help us. We ask for the hope and comfort of your spirit for all those whose lives are overshadowed by pain or illness and for all of those who are dealing with sorrow or bereavement at this time. We have a moment's silence now for you to name in your heart anyone you are holding and supporting in prayer at this time. Holy Spirit, help us. We ask for the guidance and strength of your spirit as the lockdown rules are lessened. Help us to remain focused and alert, keeping our own integrity and our conscience is clear that others may not be following the distancing rules, but we know what is right and will continue to maintain these rules until it is safe not to do so. Holy Spirit, help us. Loving God, we ask for the assurance of your Spirit to know your presence with us in our daily lives, in our relationships, in our work and service, in our worship, in our times of joy and pain. Holy Spirit, help us. Loving God, we rejoice in your Spirit. Send him again into our hearts into our lives and into our world. Hear our prayers and save us in your love. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's say and sign the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, 
and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Good morning everybody and welcome to church. Hope your week has been a, a good one and that you're all keeping well. Um, if you have been able to get away for a summer break, I really hope you enjoyed yourselves. And if you're planning to do one, I hope it all goes swimmingly well with no problems whatsoever for you. Um, there's a couple of notices today. Uh, one is from Rachel Werner. Um, if you receive uh, Bible notes like um, these that, that I get every quarter and um, first of all uh, thank you to Alex for organizing the distribution of them and um, but secondly Rachel Byrne is looking to make up a library of these so if you have any old copies that you can um, give away um, we would love to have them at SCC to make up a start a library for these so if you do have any old copies please contact uh, Rachel Burner or um, the administration um, Becky at SCC and um, they'll be really pleased to receive them from you. Thank you very much for that. And uh, secondly, had a lovely email um, from Paulette which I'll read out to you. Um, this has come uh, from uh, another parish. It says, uh, a, a hello to Mr and Mrs O'Connor in Helmwell Hempstead who kindly wrote to Paulette to say they've been following our online services and help, felt part of the church family and wanted to thank all those who have made these services possible. Uh, loving Christ from our congregation to yours and thank you for your encouragement. So it's a lovely letter from uh, Mr and Mrs O'Connor and we really do appreciate it and we really are pleased that you are enjoying our online services. So um, last thing I'd like to say, uh, buddy system is still up and running and um, very healthy. If anybody needs any help with that or wants a buddy who hasn't got one at the moment, um, please contact us and uh, we'll get that all arranged for you. Hope you have a lovely week and hope to see you soon. Bye.
So as we go out to serve, let's say these final sentences together and really think about the coming week ahead. So going out, we say, let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Blessing, honour and glory be yours, here and everywhere, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We look forward to seeing you again. Good morning. My name's Lise Jennings and I am one of the children's ministers from St. Avery Sea Salter Christian Centre. And normally we have Lighthouse um, and Sunday School. Lighthouse is a short half an hour servant service for families. Um, and then we have Sunday School in the next service at 11am. So this is replacing that in the best way that it can at the moment whilst we're on lockdown. So you are very welcome. Um, and today is the 16th of August. So thank you for joining us. So the first things you need are a Bible. You're also going to need some writing paper. Now I have got a unicorn piece of paper, but you can just use a normal piece of paper. And um, although I'm using this, you won't want to use something extra special because you will see what we do with it later. So you need a piece of paper and a pencil. So let's start. Thank you, God, that we can meet together. Thank you, Lord, that you are growing us as we are learning more about you. Grow those roots really deeply and strongly in you, I pray. Amen. So this morning, we are looking about confession. Now, you all have found out that we do confession. So we do it on our regular online service that we have now uh, before Sunday school. But we also used to do it a lot at church. In fact, we do it every Sunday. And confession is a time when we're saying sorry for the things that we've done wrong. So shall we see what the Bible has to say about confession and saying sorry? So you are going to need to um, find 1 John. Now it's very, very nearly right at the very end. Okay, so it's not one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke or John. It's a letter that John wrote and it's right at the end. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of time to find that. So it's 1 John and it's chapter one, verse eight. And then we're gonna read the rest of that chapter which is only two or three verses and then we're going to go on to read 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 so it goes across two chapters so let me just tell you that again that's 1 John chapter 1 verse 8 to 1 John chapter 2 verse 2 so are you ready if we say that we have no sin we are fooling ourselves and the truth is not in us but if we confess our sins, he will forgive our sins. We can trust God. He does what is right. He will make us clean from all the wrongs we have done. If we say we have not sinned, then we make God a liar. We do not accept God's true teaching. My dear children, I write this letter to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have Jesus Christ to help us. He is the righteous one. He defends us before God the Father. Jesus is the way our sins are taken away. And Jesus is the way that all people can have their sins taken away too. I'm just going to read that last verse again. Jesus is the way our sins are taken away. And Jesus is the way that all people can have their sins taken away too. I think it's a really important thing. And so confession is um, admitting to God that we've done wrong. It's saying sorry. Now, I wonder whether um, you know the true meaning of the word sorry. So we're going to cover that in a moment. But you might be given time to think. So when we have confession, we will um, do it slowly and come to God um, with a real truthfulness in ourselves so we're being really honest and it's a time um, to think and to say sorry for the things we've done the things we might have thought the things we may not have done that we perhaps should have done and the words that we've spoken so all of us do this 
all of us, not just children, but adults, we regularly need to come to God and say sorry. And that includes Paulette, our vicar too. So we all sin and need to say sorry. Now, sorry means that I am really sorry for what I've done. I please, I want to be forgiven. I know that I've done wrong, but I um, truly mean it and I will do my best not to do it again. Okay, it's about repenting and turning around from what we have done. So there is something amazing happens when we do that. When we come to God and we say, I'm really sorry, truly, deeply sorry for what I've done wrong. God chooses to forgive us. Jesus forgives us um, and chooses not to remember those things we've done again. So it's a bit like this. Okay. So when we sin and do something wrong, let me try and do this in front of you here. Okay. Our hearts are no longer clean. And with that, with sin, we can't have a relationship with God. Can you see that? It's like our hearts are dirty. Well, our hearts are dirty. Okay. But when we say sorry to God, Jesus, because he died on the cross for us, forgives our sins. And they are gone completely. And we are pure white again. And we can have that relationship with God, which is just amazing. So I want you to get your piece of paper now and your pencil and what you're going to do is write a letter to God and say you are sorry. So I want you to pause it in a moment and have a think, a real proper think. What is it that you need to say sorry to God for and then you're going to write it down. So I'm going to pause, we'll pause the video now and come back to me when you've written your letter because then we're going to do something specific and special. So hopefully now you have written your letter and I'm going to tell you what my letter says. It says, Dear God, I'm truly sorry for the things I do wrong, the things I say that I shouldn't say and for the times I don't do what I should do. I'm sorry for the wrong things I thought this week. Please forgive me and help me try really hard not to do it again. Amen. Now, this is the thing we're going to do next. Let me move the bowl. We are going to put it through the shedder. Because we are completely forgiven and it is forgotten. And I don't know if you could just see this here but it's all in tiny tiny pieces and it would be super hard to put that back together again and that's great because actually God doesn't do that we are forgiven through Jesus Christ so I want to tell you what your challenges are today your challenges are to Bible journal 1 John chapter 2 verses 1 and 2 and it's a bit harder to, <clears throat> to journal it, but you guys have been working on journaling and Bible journaling, so I know that you know the steps to work that through. And then I want you to think about somebody that you may have to say sorry to. So it might be your mum or your dad, <clears throat> but it's about saying sorry and really being truly repentant. You might want to write them a note and say sorry, or you might want to go up to them and say, I'm sorry, all right? But let's just pray. Father God, Lord Jesus Christ, thank you that you forgive us. Thank you that you choose not to remember what we've done and give us a clean slate, a clean heart so that we can have a relationship with God. Amen. Now I'm going to say goodbye, but do remember God doesn't say goodbye because he is with you always. Stay safe and God bless. Lots of love. Goodbye.